Thanks. Thanks for joining us again. Sorry about that. Uh, just having uh, internet dropouts here. Uh, we've just collected uh, a little piece of bamboo coral. It's a little colony, uh, and it's for a uh, Smithsonian Institute uh, genome project, uh, where we they are trying to uh, generate a full DNA genome map of these invertebrate species that we're collecting on the Great Barrier Reef, including the symbionts that live within their uh, uh, within their flesh. Uh, so it has to be preserved in a in a very special way. Uh, first of all, they have their own uh, own little box to live in, and uh, as soon as they're back, as soon as they're back up on deck, uh, we have to flash freeze them with liquid nitrogen uh, that we brought a sh uh, brought from ashore with us in cans, um, and that way it, it uh, ensures that the the uh, the DNA is in is as good a condition as possible. Um, during transport through to uh, to the Smithsonian Institute. Yeah, just to clarify, uh, the actual project, the Joan project, is run by uh, the Sanger Institute. Uh, and of course there's lots of collaborators around the world and uh, including the Smithsonian Institute and James Cook University uh, of which Jeremy Horowitz is, is our main, uh, the main collaborator there. So Jeremy's watching from ashore and giving us information through, uh, through Slack to help us in our d sampling decisions. So we're just on the side walls of this very steep canyon, the Rotter Canyon. Uh, we've established that this, this, this rock in front of us is in fact just a, a, a very large piece of debris, uh, softer sediment that's broken off and slid down, down slope. Uh, it's obviously been there for some time because the, the surface is covered with this ferromanganese oxide. But there's lots of animal life attached to the wall. And we've just collected a little bamboo coral uh, for this genome project. So before the live feed cut out for you guys, we were looking at what we, well, we weren't 100% sure what we were looking at, a very translucent uh, little invertebrate that we think may have been a type of um, holotherian sea cucumber and there's a few questions being asked about oh what happened next did we collect it so no, nothing happened next <laughs> yeah we didn't collect it uh, we just left it alone but while we're watching it the uh, the tentacles around its mouth unfolded and it was pretty clear it was a sea cucumber but uh, quite a quite a spectacular one Yep, there's another little bamboo coral. Yeah, just working up slope. Thanks, J Rod. Uh, Oh, around the corner, there's a big anemone. Just to the left there, J-Rod. Yep, we'll get to that in a second. Do you want to look at that first? Or no. The rock? It's a new, it's a new rock. Rock slash mud block. 
Yeah, I'm still thinking this is just a big piece of debris from it's rolled down that from upslope. So there was a question about why didn't we collect the sea cucumber, and the reason we didn't collect it is because um, it's not an animal that ourselves or any of the scientists that we're collaborating with are working on at the moment. Um, it's not one of our targets. Um, um, yeah, thanks. So although we're, we're interested in, in everything that we see, we're not, not interested in collecting everything. Uh, we certainly don't want to do that. There's only certain specific targets that, that we want to collect, um, either for ourselves or for our collaborators that we're working with onshore. Are they polychaetes? Could be. It's very soft, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That is super soft. Okay. Thanks, Cody. I think we've seen what we wanted to see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we don't want to... Yeah, this is just a, a large piece of debris that's broken off from above. It's rolled down slope. No rock drill. Not yet, yeah. not yet, not yet. Of course, we're interested in these hard rock outcrops. There's often lots of soft corals and, um, and black corals attached to them. But yeah, clearly this is quite soft, but certainly, um, it, you know, it's hard enough for some animals to make use of it as a habitat. So we've got, it looks like an anemone uh, clinging to the side of, on the left, uh, right in the center quite, here. Quite it's big, isn't it? beautiful, yeah. Mm. It's got a neighbor. Is yeah. that a shrimp? An anemone. An anemone. Anemone. Wow, that it's is beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, look at the uh, look at the arms. Could we get a close up look at that, please, no, Cody? Just to... <laughs> so we said we don't have um, we don't have permits to collect any vertebrates. So even if we found a dead coelacanth, no, we would not be allowed to collect it <laughs> as much as we might want to. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that is nice. It's beautiful. Yeah, good question about what is the web structure. We've got some fish people watching. I'd like to know, uh, if, are these the, I guess, the, the remains of where uh, basket eels have uh, We've seen them before where they've, they weave this kind of almost like a little plastic bag um, of, of slime looking like a, a basket and then sitting inside it. So I'd be very interested to know from the uh, from fish experts whether there are fish that create these, these kind of slime baskets that you see them attached to these or our vertical walls. So yes, we are in a marine park. Um, we are inside the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, which is also a World Heritage Site. The entire Great Barrier Reef Marine Park is also a World Heritage Area. And um, very carefully managed and uh, there's lots of different zones um, and different activities are permitted in different zones. and. Um, so we need to have, have our permits that, according to those zones that allow us to, to do certain activities in some areas but not others. Okay. Yeah, thanks Anyone? very much. Thanks, J-Rod. Yep. Um, Jeremy, if you are looking at this, is the cup coral of interest to your project? Pause here momentarily while we get an answer on that. No, no it's not jumping up and down. Sorry, I'll carry on. Yeah, no. Okay, let's head okay, up. Okay, let's head up.
There's another one of these that with cucumber slash anemone. Yeah. So it's, yeah. I mean, it's attached. It looks like it's sessile. Yeah. Tunicate? Maybe a tunicate? Uh, tunicate? I don't know. It, it looks. Yeah. So from John, I don't think eels create any slime baskets, but possibly some fish do in deep waters. Yep. Oh, Definitely have this? to find out. Oh, what's this? Is that rubbish? Yeah. Some bit of. Might be a bit of a can. It is too. It is too. It's a bit of a al what well, aluminium can. It's caught up in that. It's caught in one of those slime basket things. Can we pick it up at all? God, it's even got the writing store on it. No, that's a bit of plastic. Yeah, yeah it's very small. But have a look at the um, these probably polychaete polychaete tubes. Do you see the? Yeah, yeah, they've got their um, feeding tentacles out. Yeah. So many of them packed into such a small area. The, uh, the rock's very bi biotubated, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, yeah you can see all of the, uh, the feeding tentacles hanging out. Mm. As we're scanning past here, we're keeping our eyes peeled for any little cryptic sponges that might be hanging off those little overhangs. Mm. Up in here. Yeah. It's another one of those curious anemone slash tunicate slash holothurian next to yeah. a bamboo coral. Yeah. Very weird looking. Yeah. Like I, I was thinking it was a sea cucumber. Oh, uh, to the left. Is this a pycnogonid? Yeah. Oh, let's have a closer look at that. I think this is a pycnogonid. These are sea spiders. They're related to arachnids. So, like land spiders. Yeah. Yep, this is a sea spider. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. should um, start moving upwards and start making a bit of Yeah, well that's quite a decent size one too. Good, good, uh, probably 20 centimetres across there. It's worth still only we're still at 1700 mm. metres, we've got a long way to go. Yeah, we do, <laughs> we really, what are we now, it's nearly, uh, it's nearly one o'clock in the afternoon here in, uh, in off the Great Barrier Reef and we've We've got a fair distance to run. Uh, we had a, a few technical problems earlier in the dive, so we probably should get going. Um, but yeah, I, I quite like uh, looking at at sea spiders, but I haven't actually seen too many on any of the previous dives that we've had out here in the Coral Sea, because um, you've got to look closely for them. Mm. And they're often confused with um, uh, you know, long-legged um, crustaceans. Crustaceans, yeah. Which but you know when when you when you get a good look at them you know that they're sea spiders yeah, yeah. and we're saying no they're not related to land spiders oh well anyway uh they're they're still quite amazing I animals were, i thought they were still arachnids yeah, that's that's my though. reading of it too. But yeah. you know, because uh, knowledge moves along pretty yeah. quickly, yeah. Uh, especially in the taxonomic side of things. Um, one of our collaborators, uh, Tom Bridge, is completely rewriting uh, the shallow coral 
taxonomy for uh, Acropora, which is probably the most common of all the, the coral uh, uh, genera, and um, through Project Phoenix, just through DNA analysis, they're finding there's a lot more Acropora species, there's a lot more uh, geographic speciation than they knew previously, so they're, pr they're pretty much rewriting the entire um, shallow coral uh, taxonomy. Mm. Um, it's a lifetime's so, worth of work, isn't it? Yeah, it is, but it just shows how quickly, you know, things move very fast mm. in, the, um, in that taxonomic world, especially when you bring in DNA analysis. Go. Wow, that wow. is steep. <laughs> so we knew that we would be on quite a steep slope, and that is a steep slope. Still draped in sediment. Haven't really found any rock outcrops thus far. We need to start thinking about making some way up this transect and recover some altitude. So we're in terms of, we're only covering about 400 meters today in terms of our vertical uh, our vertical climb from about. 1750 meters up to 1350 meters but um, we could spend hours covering that 400 meters so we need to be mindful of the time it's now is this one of these gully. rills, gullies and rills yeah, that yeah. talked about this would be a rill could be a yeah a rill like mm -hmm. uh, like the smallest version of a little erosional channel and then you have gullies which are uh, hundreds of meters in size across uh, and they feed into the canyon the larger canyon axis so if you think of it in size again from largest is the canyon axis itself then gullies and then rills and i think we're probably in a rill here mm. it's like the sediment that's in the rill is quite coarse yeah compared to the mud on the sides yeah Coarse sediment. Coarse sediment, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we go quiet here, it's because we're amazed. <laughs> so we've been looking at maps of this. Um, of this area and we just we love looking at the maps making the maps and studying the maps and we can see what the topography we can see the topography on the map so that gives us an, an idea in our mind of what we might see when we're down here um, but of course until we actually get here and take a look mm. uh, yeah it was like a meter a meter in size yeah. isn't it? a meter yeah. deep into the into the slope here Waypoint Bridge. Oh, thanks. Thank you. All right, up we go. Yeah. What's Ooh, that? Here we what's go. this? Let's looks check like that out. possibly bamboo coral or something it's a on it. Whip of some sort. Jeremy, if you're watching, something attached it's got to it. A though. basket star or something attached to it. Ooh, brittle star, perhaps. The big brittle star, if it is. Yeah, I think it's a brittle star. It's wrapped all its its legs around the. Uh, around it. So Jeremy will be wanting to know whether it's got a double row of polyps. Yeah. Yeah, we need to get a good close up here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So 
we're just positioning Sebastian here so that we can stabilize, stabilize ourselves and zoom in and have a close look. Hello, Jelly. Mm -hmm. So is this a black coral it then? It does look like two rows of polyps. Looks like a black coral to me. Um, I'm not seeing... It doesn't look like a bamboo coral. No. I can't see nodes on it. Nice big healthy brittle that. star. Wow. Amazing, it's got so, the same colours as the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, a question to Jeremy is would this be an ideal candidate for the Genome Project? So, yeah, um, grab the top 25%. And it's to go in the quiver for the liquid nitrogen? Okay. Oh, no. Or, no, no. It can just go in a bio box. Okay, so we'd like to collect a fragment of the game for that. Uh, Jeremy's saying it's a soft coral. It does not need to go in the quiver, it's just going to box. <laughs> yeah, so it's not a black coral, uh, it's a soft coral, an octocoral. I was trying not to look at you. <laughs> Still plenty of little uh, sea pigs. Yeah, they're everywhere heaps, still, aren't they? Heaps there. Yeah. Looks good. Looks good. Would you guys like us to put this uh, bio box in one bee? Um, we might put it in, we might save the little A, B, C, D ones for if that's quite long. We can put it in. Oh, the tools are in box two, right? Yeah. Well, we might just put it in the bag. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can put in a bigger one. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, it's about to break. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that soft coral is pretty strong, yeah. Again? No, no, not bamboo. Yeah.
bring in the other arm here. Two hands better than one. Yeah, there we go. That'll solve it. There you go. There we are. Sorry about that uh, basket star. Yeah, so we've been careful how how many samples we take. Uh, we don't have a big science team on board uh, compared to our previous expedition where we had quite a few people. Uh, we've only got um, myself, Marty, Vicky, uh, Valerie and Joan on board uh, to take care of all the, the um, preservation of the samples uh, at the end of the dive. So uh, we don't want to overload either ourselves or the ROV team. So we've been quite careful about what we're, what we're collecting uh, during the dives. All right, on we go. Onwards and upwards. Thanks, Gerald. Thank how soft that sediment is. I guess we wonder how deep it is before the, you hit the hard rock below. Yeah, it um, could be, who knows, hundreds of metres thick. Yeah. yeah. The sediment's been building up for a very long time. I mean, the whole edge of Australia uh, is, broke off during the break of Gondwana at the, you know, at the end of the Cretaceous. And so, you know, Oh, that's interesting. It's a rocky rock and it's got this something looks on the edge interesting. That looks rocky. Okay. So I know that. Yeah, um, let's have a closer look. Yeah, this is bamboo coral. Uh, you can see the nodes on it. Brachiopods. Can we just get a closer look at these, please? They look like brachiopods yeah, to me. Yeah. Nice. Oh, that's interesting. And Have we got a permit? Sponges. Yeah, they look like sponges. These little translucent things. Yeah. But so these open. These look like brachiopods to me. All right. So. That's significant. I think a few things of interest here. Yeah, brachiopods are this ancient group of um, of mollusks. 
Well, they're uh, not mollusks, they're their own phyla. Well, sorry, they, you're right, they're their own phyla. Um, they look very similar to bivalves, uh, but when they thrived in the, uh, in, uh, in the, the seas of, you know, 400 million, yeah, 400. 400 million years ago, uh, they dominated uh, the, the shallow marine environment. And uh, behind Cairns is a, there's a big limestone area, uh, it's a Devonian reef complex called Chiligo, and it's got, uh, you can see these big brachypods, big thick brachypods in the limestone rock. We do know that they exist in the, um, in the, these cooler coral sea waters because I was part of an expedition run by Gert Vorheid from, uh, from Germany back in 2009, they were specifically looking for brachypods uh, and they found living ones out in the coral sea on the Osprey Reef. They look very suspiciously like brachypods. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's what They're quite they're delicate there. looking, like they're not big solid shells. These are the living, of course, the living relict um, brachypods that we have here. Uh, they don't have these big thick shells. They're quite, uh, quite, uh, quite thin shells but um, they have this really distinct um, opening so we're just um, getting Sebastian into a, a good stable position here and we're going to have a close look at some of these things and we probably will collect some samples um, brachiopods of course are invertebrates and we mm. are in a zone at Ooh, the moment that would allow us to collect yeah, those. This is hexactinella coral, uh, it's coral sponge on the yeah. right. So we yeah. definitely will yeah. so stop this... here for a bit and get, do some collecting. Oh, is this, a, is this yeah, a black coral? There is so much. Okay, so, so in the in the lower uh, lower centre, this is um, a siliceous sponge. And I think we're looking at a black coral above it. Yeah. Definitely looks like sponge. But have a look. These oh, like look like brachiopods all around. Jeremy's asking to collect the black coral. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. What would you like to go so we would like to. While we're on the sponge, we'll go to the sponge. I think we should collect the sponge. It's a glass sponge. Yeah, and, definitely. Um, you know, there really hasn't been much collecting here in this depth in this location ever. So yeah. I, I do think we should collect that. Um, the sponges go to Queensland Museum and looked after by uh, Merrick Eakins, who's the senior curator of uh, invertebrate taxonomy at the uh, Museum of Queensland. They look like brachiopods. Yeah, I'm sure that they are brachiopods. Um, so I think we should collect a couple of those as well. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I know some of the, ta the brachiopod taxonomists from Germany uh, mm -hmm. from that, that earlier expedition. They'd be quite interested in this. Yeah. yeah. And then after the Permian extinction, brachiopods all but died out. Uh, and it, you know, it took time, but it was the bivalves that really mm, took became t took over that that niche. Mm. Except in mainly these deeper waters, where you have these a few relic species living. Do you see what's inside? Mm, the it's sort of like little shrimp hats. Yeah. Those little flecks of pink coloring. Which may be something that the sponge has ingested, perhaps, or just using it as a or as a habitat. Yeah. Yeah. Scale worms. Scale worms. Scale worms. There's a shrimp hiding in behind there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's a couple in behind there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is that the loaf of four of the brachiopod sticking out, or is that something else? 
don't know, yeah. don't know, but yeah, definitely yeah. look like bracket pots. We're gonna, let's collect that Yeah, look how many there are. Fantastic. And then we'll come back to the brachiopods and then there's a black coral sitting above the sponge that will come come onto as well. That is really interesting. Where would you like this I think it needs to go in the back, please. Sorry, shrimps. This is not uh, not your best day. So this is a silicious sponge or glass sponge. comprised of spicules that are made from silica, which is glass, of course, or well, glass is made from silica. Hence, we call these glass sponges. So this will be, this sample will go to Merrick Eakins at the Queensland Museum in Brisbane. Shrimp. Now's your opportunity to hop off. He's an invertebrate. He can come along for the ride. Shrimp. Of course, there's, there's of course there's scientific interest in the associates that are living on these samples, the sponges and the corals. It's again, it's part of the ecology that we really don't know much about. Um, other methods of sampling, um, like taking dredges, for example, you just get a bulk lot of samples up in a bag or a scoop at the end, and you don't know what was actually living with what. Uh, and so that's one of the great advantages of having ROV, ROV Sebastian is that you have the uh, situational context um, of exactly how the target sample was in situ when it was before we collected it. Um, so that gives us a lot more information. Now, what's that black coral? It was quite pink. Yep, there it goes. Um, yeah, I just checked my uh, my publications. The uh, as a Tina four. Yeah. Tina four. So back in two thousand and nine, uh, Gert Vorheid from Munich came out to Australia. The big team of people. He brought with him Carsten Luther. Carsten's from Berlin, uh, from the museum there. He was particularly interested in these relic fauna, uh, these brachiopods, and. Uh, I just checked the photos that they took from that 2009 voyage out at Osprey Reef and the brachiopods there look the same as these okay. these ones. So yeah. I'm pretty sure that we're looking at brachiopods. go back to that black coral that we saw on the rock above us um, but while we're in this position and Sebastian is nice and comfortable here we'll sample the brachiopods while we're here
Oh, I love these big vertical walls. Mm. There's all sorts of things hiding on them. Piece of rubbish that we collected at the mm, start of the dive. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we did see a fair bit of a uh, bit of plastic. Uh, obviously, drifted out from the the shelf, uh, the, the Great Barrier Shelf. There's a lot of tidal flow backwards and forwards each day. And this canyon is a connected. It's, it's a shelf connected canyon. Uh, there's an old river channel that directly um, connects through to the head of this canyon. Uh, clearly lots of organic material like uh, wood debris and algae and things like that including any plastic that might be in the water it's uh, it's all drifted down and it's on the um, we, we saw some at the earlier part of the dive Let's see if we can get suction up some of these brachiopods I have very rarely ever seen a living one right mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, they, their relic fauna live in these deeper, colder waters. Um, but, you know, their cousins long since died out at the end of the Permian extinction. We have an, an infaunal brachiopod that lives in Morton Bay, um, Lingula. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. It's remained unchanged yeah. over millions of years. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah it, like it's the same species of Lingula that they find it in the fossil record going That's, back millions of years yeah. so informally we call them a living a living fossil yeah so these are these would be similar living yeah. living fossils yeah. but uh, i i spend a bit of time with my family going up to chiligo caves and much of the limestone that you walk over are brachiopods oh, yeah. big but really big yes. thick mm -hmm. thick shelled brachiopods you know like uh, at least the shells are five millimeters thick. Wow, that's solid. Yeah, that's really solid, robust. about the size of your hand. Yeah. Uh, quite spectacular when they're, uh, it's all polished up. Uh, it's a good collection of brachiopods. Yeah. Just looking at those tiny little sponges that are on the wall there. Yeah, now how, while are we we're here and we're parked and we've got the suction sampler out, we might can we scrape Let's them off the rock? Yeah, I'm sure Merrick would be keen on yeah. them. Checking the suction sample jar for brachiopod. Where did they go? There we go. And there it is. That's our little collection of brachiopods. <laughs> ah. Oh, that's good. We've got a few. have got quite a little collection in there. That's excellent. That's nice. Ah, yeah. oh, look at that. Yeah, I think we need to, re we'll probably reach out to Carsten Luther, yeah. and he'd be very interested in this. Yeah. So we've Any got of the regulars are, have noticed that we've got beautiful, brand new, shiny jars. Tom is very interested in this mm. as well. So, what? Is that a, what? No, is that a jelly? Yeah, he's playing on the outside. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, he's on the outside, is he? Or is he in the jar? I think he's inside. He's inside the jar. Oh, well, that is opportunistic. Audience, that's for Dougal. That's it. Yeah. Skillage. That is skillage. That's skillage right there. Thanks, Cody. So, we didn't mean to get the jelly, but it's fortunate that we did, and we'll pop that in formal and, and keep it for Dougal. Alright. 
<laughs> Jeremy wants to know when will we accidentally catch a black coral when we're trying to collect the jelly. <laughs> <laughs> patience, Jeremy, patience. <laughs> we haven't forgotten about your black coral that's sitting on the top of this outcrop here. We just, um, we're looking at these tiny little sponges now that are sitting on here. Um, now, I don't know if these are the carnivorous sponges that Merrick is particularly interested in, but I know that he is interested in deep water, cold water sponges. So we will collect these while we're here. And on our last expedition, it turned out that every sponge we collected for Merrick was an undescribed species. Uh, so there's a good chance soft? that... There we go. So the sponges were attached to that chunk that, that came off, so I'm going to grab that. And we might, is, we might actually, what we might is it just an oil shell? Chest. Is it chest or is it shell? Is it something on it? In it? Being it's breaking up. Anything in the It's very soft, I think. Wow. It's very fragile. Hmm. Stuff is very soft. Sitting in the chair with me at the moment is Joan, one of the students who's joined us on board RV Falcor. Uh, okay. uh, Joan is a master's student from James Cook University in Townsville. Um, you can introduce what you're studying and um, how you got put up to this. Just talk to me. Yeah. Thanks, Marty. Um, so I'm currently a master's student at James Cook University and getting to know about this trip is pure coincidence at the beginning. Uh, we were just doing a project with one of our supervisor who knows Rob, who's the lead investigator for this trip. Uh, since the COVID started, uh, Falcor is doing a lot of things along the Australian coastlines and this project has just been put up very recently and they have two vacancies open for students. Our supervisor <laughs> asked us whether we're free and we couldn't really say no to such opportunity. <laughs> it, w it all happened very quickly at the last minute, didn't very it? Quickly. We yeah. didn't have a lot of um, time to think about the decision. It was just, yes, let's go. <laughs> Pretty much prepared. The email was sent at 9 p.m replied and replied during within 12 hours and this one is set yeah <laughs> so of course this is a fantastic opportunity for students um yeah to come along and experience what it's like on a research expedition also um, as marine biology students we always want to see different parts of the ocean yeah. normally we go snorkeling diving or watch up from the sky there's not really a lot of chance we can see deep ocean into the ocean yeah. yeah that's right it's such a unique opportunity for for all of us to experience the deep ocean um okay here we are so um joan and our other student valerie have been uh what would you say coached by jeremy into yes. um sort of being res taking responsibility for these collections for jeremy and you've helped us organize uh, the liquid nitrogen that we've brought on board um, for preserving these samples and yeah like for example this currently black corals that we're focusing on we're also remotely coached by Jeremy at this moment uh -huh. uh, we're trying to get a really good 
focus on the front part of this black coral so we can see if there's any tiny branches on the, uh, on the skeleton where if it's possible we can have a zoom in at where the branches are meet on the stem okay yep so jeremy we've got rock em and sock em out and we're just um stabilizing here There's a question on the live feed asking how long is an average expedition? Um, I think they all vary. It depends on the location and the expedition. This one is particularly long. I guess um, in total it's 47 days, so that wouldn't necessarily be typical. Um, a typical expedition might be anything from two weeks to four weeks. So for this coral we're looking at, it's belonged to family Schizopathidae and where we can see as all these branches, they are sub-opposite so it is belongs to the genus Bathypathus. Can we get a lasers on the reference? Lasers on. Yeah, lasers are on. Lasers I feel like I'm sitting on. right next to Jeremy for real now. <laughs> 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 so Jeremy's pinging Joan and Valerie with <laughs> messages in our private chat um, and I see that he's also been on the YouTube chat as well so uh, and we're just trying to confirm with Jeremy how much he would like to collect for this very specific black corals so with the laser on, the laser, the, the two green dots on the screen, the distance between them is around 10 centimeters. Uh, so we can use that as a rough uh, estimation to estimate the distance between the branches on one side. If it's roughly about one centimeter, it's highly possible to be Bathypathus patula. And we're going to collect the whole thing. So we can have a little bit more study afterwards. <laughs> Terrific. So Jeremy, is this a collection that we would put into the bio box? Not the um, quiver, which would be for the liquid nitrogen. Yes, in the yep, bio box. In the bio box. Radio. Since we're collecting the whole colony for this one, um, my guess would be this might be something that Jeremy was looking out for on the previous expedition that we missed, that we didn't see or didn't find. Yeah. Um, there we go, we've collected the whole thing from the base, very nice. Sometime when these colonies, you can. Oh, okay. Um, Jeremy's asked if we can not mix it with the sponges, but that's not possible. That's not. We can't. No, it's not possible. The size of this coral is pretty big, and usually it is because when it's a deep sea um, species. Uh, when we bring it up to the surface, where, as the time passes by, the genetic material will degrade. So sometimes we need quite a bit of the colony 
to do a proper species identification on the surface. And the list of species will be given to Grumpa and Marine Park personnel to have a better ability of conserving overall biodiversity. <laughs> That's right, because even the Marine Park, well I say even the Marine Park managers, um, the scientists don't know what's down here. This is the first expedition that we've been in this region with an ROV to capture this um, imagery. So of course the Marine Park managers also uh, part of our role is to provide this data and, and this information to the Marine Park managers so that uh, they get the information about what communities are inhabiting different parts of the Marine Park. And then that helps them with their planning and decision making with respect to con species conservation and protected areas. Oops, sorry. 